Any other questions from anyone? Logistical or otherwise? Things going okay? Okay. Uh, I wanted to, I've been getting a couple of uh, logistical questions from people around the lab reports. So I thought I would just show you, I put a Piazza post up, but I wanted to just show you where you can find um, information on um, formatting for the lab reports and the expected content. So if you go to the 5760 page, the first link under re uh, reading assignments is this policy page. And this contains a bunch of stuff, but of particular interest perhaps is the expected content within each lab report. So this is the stuff that is expected to be in every report. And then on the, uh, on the web page for lab one specifically at the bottom, there's a few more additional things that are expected for the lab one report. So you can take a look at this and if you have any questions, you can just ask me. Um, and then there's some stuff that is maybe also of interest just about grading and these sorts of things. I'll remind folks that 50% um, of the course grades lab assignments and of those lab assignments um, are associated with that lab assignment grade. The 20% comes from the weekly checkpoints, 30% on the demo, and then 50% on your lab write up itself. And then the same is true for final projects. Just in case folks hadn't found this page, I wanted to make sure that that was clear. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so say that you are in the Friday lab and you want to demo earlier, um, just to make sure that like you have everything correctly ran. So say you demo on Monday and you realize, oh, you know, there's certain things that are off that you need to fix. Does that count as your demo or can you, again, you know, edit your code and, and make sure that your demo works properly for them to be demoed again on Friday? I would say that you can, if it's before your deadline, you can demo again, um, just as long as it is, it is fully demonstrated and complete by your particular lab section's deadline. Although that being said, please, you know, just in the interest of sort of allocating instructor time and resources, um, wait to demo until you feel like you're ready to demo, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so I'm on the lab one page now, and then down here at the bottom is just some additional items that should be included in the lab one report specifically. And then these items exist for lab two as well. I think I might add one for lab two, which is, um, I would, I don't think it's included yet. I would like for, for lab two, this is still a ways off, so it's nothing to worry about for, for the time being, but I'd like to know what your limiting resource is, mostly because I think it's interesting. I, I wanna see sort of what the limiting resource for different groups is based on different implementations, because I expect that it will be different for different groups, because we saw that the resources here are actually pretty balanced. It's kind of whether you run out of multipliers or whether you run out of MTMK blocks or logic elements. Some people might run out of different things. So I think it would be kind of interesting to see which groups run out of what. So we'll add that. I'll, I'll put that there in the next week or so. Um, any other logistical stuff? There are a few things I wanted to. Oh, and then I'll make the lab reports. Uh, I'll just put a, an assignment on Canvas so that you can turn them in through Canvas. We'll just do like PDF documents through Canvas. I think that's easy. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, sending videos. Oh yeah, and there's a there's a for submitting your videos um, on this web page. It it tells you to email video of your uh, system working to the TA. We'll I'll put together like a Cornell box folder so that people can drop videos into that box folder. And maybe we can manage the videos that way. Any questions? That suggests that you 
better be a little careful about the naming protocol for the videos or they're all going to be called lab two final. <laughs> yeah. So please include your, at least one member of your group's net ID in the file name. Sound good. Uh, and the other thing I'm going to do is I have, I'm ordering a bunch of external drives. Katie and I experimented last week with plugging an external hard drive into one of the lab PCs. And then I could log in with my net ID and put a file in there. And then she could later log in with her net ID and access and edit that file. So I think that's a nice solution for sharing resources among group members, as opposed to putting things on box or emailing them or that sort of thing. There, there'll be some local permanent storage shared among all group members. But I have to order that stuff, so that won't be set up for maybe another week or so. Anything else? If not, I wanna finish, I wanna finish our discussion about memory and then get into a parallelization scheme for the drum solver. Okay, so um, we were talking last week about the resources on our FPGA. And I'll just remind folks of what those resources are. So um, we, we, we've looked at this table a couple of times, but um, of particular interest for the discussion right now is uh, this 3,970 kilobits of M10K memory. I want to talk specifically about this M10K memory because this is the, the recommended memory that you use to store your state information for lab two. Um, this M10K memory is uh, organized into blocks. Into blocks um, of configurable size. So um, you might have an M10K memory block so block sizes include, let's just make a list here. Um, you might have an M10K memory block that is one bit by 8K, which is to say it can hold 8,000 uh, one bit pieces of information. You might have two bit by 4K, uh, there's a whole bunch of various options. Of particular interest, I think, for lab two is one of the block sizes is 20 bit by 512. Because um, you'll recall that the recommended resolution with which you keep track of the state is 18 bits. So 20 bit by 5K, that's, that, that uses that memory block pretty well. So you'll, you'll instantiate a bunch of these M10K memory blocks and use these different memory blocks to store the state information, uh, which raises the question, how, uh, how do we tell the compiler what kind of memory we want? So, which is to say, suppose, suppose that we have something like this. Um, so suppose we have some 18 bit 512 long bit of memory here. Um, how do we tell Portis? that we want this in an M10K block versus registers versus other sorts of memory, maybe MLAB blocks. Um, how do we tell it what we want? Turns out there are a few different options, some of which, that are, some of which are slightly more bizarre than others, but uh, you have three options. Let's separate this out. So we'll say, we'll say option one. Option one is um, mega functions, which is Altera IP. 
And this is, uh, these are available in the Cordis IP library. I'll show you where I mean. So within Cordis, and so you're all familiar with this screen at this point. Um, within Cordis, over on the right side of the screen, there's an IP catalog. And within this IP catalog, there is a number of different on-chip memory options. So this is one method by which you can specify the particular size and type of memory that you want. Um, and there are some things that are nice about this and some things that are, that are uh, less nice about this. One of the nice things about it is it does give you a tremendous amount of control over that memory. So you can initialize, you can, you can point it to an initialization file or something. Um, the, I would say maybe one of the drawbacks is it's a little bit obfuscated behind Cordis stuff. So it, it, when you're looking at your Verilog, it's a little, it, precisely what you've built is a little bit obfuscated behind this sort of Cordis user interface. Um, but you can feel free to use this if you want. I will add that I uh, have not played with this particular option much yet. So I can't help you much uh, if you're building memory like this, but many of you don't need my help anyway. So if you want to use this option, um, you, you can certainly feel free to do so. I think there's another limitation to that one. And, and since it is in a Quartus uh, a syntax, it does not simulate well in model sim. I think it generates simulation files. So I think with, with some work, you can get it to simulate, but it does take some work because it's not just Verilog. It's, there's some extra steps involved. Um, in any case, so that, that's option one. Option two is um, HDL, HDL style, which infers memory types. This is my favorite option, um, but I'm also biased because I haven't experimented tremendously much with the other one. So it's just the one that I'm most familiar with. But if you look at, um, if we take a look at, where's this linked up? This is in, oh, I was just looking at this. Where did I, where did I find it? It's in F FPGA memory, just below the design examples. FPGA up. memory. Ah, yes, thank you. Um, if you take a look at, there's a document linked here within the FPGA memory page called HDL style guide. Within this document, this document tells you how you can construct, how you can put together Verilog such that the compiler will inform uh, a particular type of memory based on your Verilog style. And this works from, from multipliers too, incidentally, and I'll show you what I mean by that. But there's a whole bunch of stuff here, uh, inferring memory functions from HDL code. So these are all of the various sorts of um, kinds of memory that one can infer with various syntax. Of particular interest to us is down here, let's see. It tells you what to avoid as well, which is kind of nice. Um, so simple dual port, dual clock synchronous RAM. So if you build a memory uh, module, let me copy this, with this style, Um, if you use this style of Verilog in order to build your memory module, the compiler will infer an M10K block. 
tabbing got a little screwed up here. That's okay. Um, and this is also elaborated upon on this memory web page. The one, the one thing to be a little bit careful of here is a characteristic of these M10K blocks is um, you can write to these blocks in a single cycle. It takes two cycles to read from the block, but that can be pipeline. So if you, the, the advantage of this, of this method of um, inferring a particular type of memory is it's immediately uh, simulatable because it's just Verilog, but keep in mind in your simulation that it may not simulate the extra cycle that it takes to read from this block. Um, if you would like down here, this is an example of a module that accurately simulates the extra cycle that it takes to read from this M10K block. So if you wanna do a simulation, you're gonna do a bunch of simulations. When you're simulating this, these memory blocks, use this sort of style with, with the, uh, the extra cycle in order to read. And then for synthesis, use the style uh, as given in that HDL style guide. Okay, so in short, if you style your Verilog in a certain way, and the ways that you style it is given in this HDL style guide, if you style it in a certain way, then Cordis infers a particular memory type. So when it sees this, it says, ah, okay, the user wants an M10K block. So I'll use an M10K block there. Questions about that? And then the module itself is, is, is pretty straightforward to look at. So, um, you know, this takes uh, an input, it, this particular M10K block is for storing 512 18-bit pieces of information. Sounds very relevant for lab two. Um, it takes an 18-bit piece of input data, takes the read address and write address, which in this case is nine bits, takes a read enable, write enable, and a clock. Um, this is the actual memory here, right? So we have 512, a 512 long array of 18-bit uh, pieces of information. And then at every positive edge of the clock, it, if the write enable is asserted, it, um, it passes the data into this memory block at the, part, at the write address that's been, that, that has been passed in. And then if the, read address, if the read enable is asserted, it gets data from that, write address, from that read address and passes it out through the output. Okay. And we'll, go, uh, we'll, we'll, if not today, then next time, we'll look at some um, examples of, I'll do some examples of reading and writing to this in, in, a, in a program. Okay. And then there's the third option, which, which to me is the weirdest, but maybe it's just because I'm not as, uh, I haven't used it as much. So option three is, what do they call this? It's, it's um, sy synthesis comments, I guess, is the clearest way to put this. Um, and the easiest way for me to talk about this is just to show you it turns out that we can look at, this is the synthesis attributes page. Um, I'm gonna look specifically at RAM style, which is type of RAM. Um, suppose that we were creating some, some bit of memory here. So in this case, we're creating, um, um, eight by 64, an eight by 64 memory block here. Turns out that if you put an inline comment next to this declaration and you, and that the first word is synthesis, 
that tells the compiler that this is, this is for me to do something with. So you can put synthesis, in this case, RAM style equals the type of memory that you want to build. In this case, they're building M144K. Um, if you wanted to build M10K blocks, then you would put M10K there. Um, so this is all in a comment, which is not synthesized. This is just interpreted at compile time. And notice too that this comment must be before the semicolon. So you can use comments with this, of this style in order to tell the compiler that you want RAM memory of a particular variety. Could be M10K, could be MLAB, if you wanted to build an MLAB block. So, again, so it's another option, okay? And it, 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 there are a whole bunch of these um, synthesis comments some of which are maybe useful for you, many of which I haven't found tremendously much use for. Um, another one that's potentially interesting is MOLT style. If you are doing multiplication, you can use synthesis comments of a similar variety in order to tell the compiler that you, for instance, want for this multiplication to use a hardware DSP, a hardware multiplier, a DSP block, as opposed to building it from logic elements. Um, you can also, just like the, the, the memory, you can infer multiplier type from Verilog syntax as well. And in fact, you already saw that for lab one, that signed multiply module that was in accordance with the HDL guide in order to infer a hardware multiply. But we could have alternatively used these, these sort of inline, the, these inline comments that are interpreted by the compiler. So you can use this with you if you want. Um, In, in my brain, I find the Verilog syntax to be sort of the clearest when I'm trying to debug things, but you all may, may have different opinions. So it just depends on what you prefer. And you can kind of browse the other options here. Um, the, the other stuff that you can tell the compiler to do with these synthesis comments. Um, anything else here that might be interesting to look at? Maybe preserve, um, I believe, if I'm looking at the right one here, this will, if you're declaring any uh, registers or anything of the sort that you're not using in your program, the compiler will also op often optimize those away. If for any reason you want to keep those, if you're using them for some sort of debugging purpose, you can tell the compiler not to optimize away that particular register or wire. Okay. In particular, Quartus does this weird optimization. If it detects, somehow it detects that you're using a, a signal as a state variable, then it will optimize away the state variable and replace it with a one hot controller. And if you want to be able to signal tap that state variable, you need to preserve it. I found that bewildering. Any questions about these options? So I'll just put uh, C links on FPGA memory web page. So up to you, whatever you prefer. Um, If there aren't questions about this, then I'm gonna start talking about a strategy for parallelizing the drum.
Okay, interrupt me if anything occurs to you. Um, so it, in thinking about drum parallelization, as I talked about last time, there are a whole bunch of different options. Um, and you can do this however you'd like. What I'm gonna present here is the method of parallelization that has produced the biggest drums that we've seen. So if you wanna produce, and maybe you can come up with a method that does even better. Um, but this is, this is the strategy for parallelization that has produced the most nodes that we've seen in this class. So many options exist. Um, the method that has been able to simulate the most nodes that we've seen is to parallelize, move my zoom window, parallelize across rows and serialize up columns. I'll show you a picture of what I mean. So if we think about the, so I get my image. If we think about the drum as a series of columns, okay, so we think about the drum as a collection of columns and rows, then the strategy that we've seen that produces the most nodes is to parallelize your computation across a row and then in the next uh, update, in the next, uh, I'll say serially after this operation, you would move up one, up one row and compute the next row in parallel. Can I just go back and like that means in terms of like, does that mean like in one clock cycle, you'll be doing an entire row and then the next clock cycle, another row? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you will have, you know, if you have a compute module for a particular um, node that's doing the integration, you'll have many copies of that compute module going across this row. And we'll talk next time about um, generate statements, which is a, a means by which you can generate lots of identical hardware. So an option for, for creating all of that hardware is to by hand sort of write a whole bunch, copy your module a whole bunch of times into some very, very long piece of Verilog. That's highly error prone. So the better way to do this is to use a generate statement, which um, systematically generates a whole bunch of copies of the same piece of hardware. So that you can use a generate statement to build integrators across the whole row and then serially move up the row as, as you can move up as many rows as the cycles between audio samples will allow. So if each row takes you five cycles to compute and you have a thousand cycles to spend, then you can move up as many rows as you can fit into a thousand cycles in order to be completely done updating the drum by the next time the next audio sample, by the time the next audio sample comes. Okay, so in terms of like uh, the integrators and, and how you do that with a clock, are you basically creating like a, a longer clock and then doing a clock divider so that every row is on its own clock? Um, that way, like Bruce was saying, you can't, you can't update this one row at a time. You have to make sure it's updated all at the same time. Um, and you can't, if you're doing one each on a clock cycle, I, I don't exactly know how you're like calling those functions and, and clocking them in a way that doesn't just update one row at a time. So they, they, they do all share the same clock. Um, you need to be very careful about when you come up with a, when you update the drum state, you don't use that updated state until the next time you sweep through the drum. So you, you are, we're going to be storing the state of this drum in each column will get its own pair of M10K blocks. So for each column, we'll have an M10K block that's holding 
the state of each node at time step n and the state of each node at time step n minus one. And as we move up the drum, we're going to read those states out of memory, use them to compute the updated state, store that updated state back in memory so that the next time through we can use it again. Okay. But if you do it this way, right, then the number of parallel columns that you can build is limited by hardware because you're doing all of the columns in parallel. So the number of columns is limited by how much memory do you have? How many multipliers do you have? How much parallel hardware can you build on the FPGA? The height of the drum is limited by how fast can you move up it? How efficient can you make your state machine? The less cycles that it takes for you to update a single row of this drum, the more rows that you can go through and the bigger a drum that you can build. And the other little cheat is, like I, like I mentioned last time, you can also make your own PLL to run at 100 megahertz instead of 50 megahertz, which allows you to move further up this drum. But at a high level, this is, this is what we're thinking is, parallelize across columns and then really move up the drum. Do you mean parallelize across rows? Yeah, I guess so. I, I, I mean, parallelize in, in one dimension and then move serially in the other dimension. Okay. Yeah. So we're computing in this particular picture, the update for each of these nodes would be computed in parallel. And then once we've updated all of these, we pop up to the next one and update the next row in parallel. So I want to think about, let's think about one column of this drum. Because if we can build, if, if we can build the hardware for one column, it's that hardware that gets copied over and over and over again, right? So we should think about, let's think about one column of this drum. I don't remember what my next picture is. Let's see. Okay. Okay, let, let's start, let's start even, even narrower. Let's think about one node of the drum. So, like I, like I mentioned to Katie earlier, the, the sort of core primitive at the, at the base of all of this is some compute module. This is going to be some combinatoric module that's much like the integrate modules that you guys built for lab one, but just with this equation implemented instead of the Lorenz equation, equations implemented. So what this module will do is it will take as inputs the amplitude of the node that's being updated, the sort of center node pictured here at time step n, it'll take the amplitude of that same node at the previous time step, and then it'll take the amplitudes of all of the adjacent nodes. And then it will return as an output the amplitude of this node at time step n plus one. So it'll update that center node. So when you start working on lab two, the first thing to start working on is this compute module. And you'll start working on it in model sim. So the, the, the first thing to do is build this compute module that takes these as inputs and then through implementation of this equation returns this as an output. Build that in model sim and then test it by giving the center node some set of initial conditions. So sort of holding that node at some amplitude and assume that you're holding it stationary at some amplitude, which is to say u n i j is the same as u n minus one at i j. It's not moving initially, you're just holding it. So give that some initial conditions, hold all of the adjacent nodes at zero, and then run it. And what you should see is, if you think about this physically, what you would expect to happen is it's going to bounce up and down, right? It'll be some decaying sinusoid. So the first sanity check to get through is to build this module, zero all of the boundary conditions, give yourself some, some initial amplitude here and run it and see if you get that decaying sinusoid out. Make sense? 
Um, I have a question. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if this is like super trivial or I'm just like not thinking about this correctly, but like, let's say that you're looking at a node that's like on the edge or a corner of the drum. What do you like, like what do you input in as like the node that's next to it? So that, that's a very good question. It's, so that's a question about boundary conditions. Um, if you think about an actual drum, those boundaries are, the drum is sort of tied down to some, uh, some rim, right? So those are fixed boundary conditions. So you, you, you would tie those boundaries to zero amplitude. So at the top, at the bottom, and at the edges, the furthest out nodes, their boundary conditions will be zero. Now, there is a little cheat, which is, Um, suppose you only simulated one quarter of the drum. So you suppose you had a square drum and you divided it into four quadrants, right? And you built a simulation for as many nodes as you can manage in one corner. The edges of that quadrant that interface with the outside of the drum would be tied to zero boundary conditions. If you assume, if you mirror the boundary conditions at the other edges, through symmetry, you're effectively building a drum that's four times bigger. Now you won't get any extra points for that, right? Your, your performance grade will be associated with the actual number of nodes that you simulate. So you can't use strategic choice of boundary conditions and say simulate, you know, a hundred nodes and then say through symmetry, this is actually the sound being generated by 400 nodes. That's true, but you're not simulating those extra 300 nodes. You're making a symmetry argument. However, if you wanted to do that in order to meet one of your, in order to meet that requirement of making three different sounds with your drum, that would be perfectly okay. Right, so with zero boundary conditions, with zero boundary conditions, then you're building a drum with as many nodes as you are actually integrating. With sneaky boundary conditions, you could build a drum that is making the sound of a drum with four times as many nodes as you're actually simulating. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. You could also think if, if you have, uh, you could have other distributed systems besides a drum head. Let's say you bang on a plate of steel. Now the edges are free to vibrate back and forth, which is equivalent to the free boundary condition of, a, <clears throat> of, a, of the interior edge of the symmetric case. So you can imagine having a, oh, here's a, here's a vocabulary term. Do you remember the terms Dirichlet and von Neumann boundary conditions? Some partial differential equations class? Look it up. So with zero boundary conditions, you'll build a drum. With free boundary conditions, you would build something maybe like a gong, which would be cool. You could do that. It's fine. Um, you're, you're, you're being evaluated on the number of nodes that you're simulating. The boundary conditions are up to you, and it's just going to result in different sounds. But drum would be zero. Something gong-like or hitting a piece of steel, like Bruce said, would be uh, free boundary. Uh, okay, mathematically, what is like a free boundary case in this kind of situation? Like, like tying it to zero is like fixed. That makes sense to me, right? But like, I don't, so yeah, I don't free know, boundary like, what, would mean yeah. it would mean there's no slope at the boundary. So what that would mean is if if say you're at the edge node and your question is, what value should I use for? Uh, the next node, sort of the boundary node. In the case of a drum, that boundary node would be zero. In the case of a gong or a free boundary condition, it would be the same as the edge node. Okay, got it. So there's no force at the boundary in that case. Right. So there can't be any slope, yeah. Other questions? 
Okay. So that was, I lied, that was thinking about one note of the drum. Let's now think about one column of the drum. So for each column of the drum, like I mentioned when I was talking to Katie, we're going to have two M10K blocks. So we're going to zoom in on a moment of one of these columns, but I'm just making the point here that for every column, there will be two M10K blocks. One of those M10K blocks is holding the current state, the current amplitude of each node, that is to say U, U superscript N, and the other M10K block will be holding the previous state of each node which is to say u superscript n plus one. We need both because our update equation requires both the n time step amplitudes and the n minus one time step amplitudes. So we must store both of those pieces, both of those states. So we can think about how to tie those M10K blocks. So this is for one column. So let me just make that clear. So for a column, we can think about this in the following way. Um, and we'll dwell on this for a while next time as well, but we have these two M10K blocks associated with each column. Those M10K blocks will be initialized with the initial condition for your drum, right? So before you start running your simulation, you will fill these memory blocks with the initial conditions. Um, we will also have a separate register that's gonna store the amplitude of just the bottom node. And it's gonna become clear why we're keeping this in a separate register in a moment. Okay, but so we have two M10K blocks that are storing the amplitudes at time steps N and N minus one for every node in the column. And then a register that's also storing just the amplitude for that bottom node. And these are all being fed into that compute module, which you'll recall takes in the amplitudes of the nodes above, below, on either side, at the center and at the center at the previous time step for each node that we're updating. So we're reading information out of these M10K blocks. And if you suppose that we are starting, let, let's imagine that we are at the bottom of the drum, right? So we are down here in this row. We're starting our simulation at the bottom of the drum and we're gonna work our way up. At the bottom of the drum, we will pass into the compute module the through a MUX here that decides whether we're gonna pass in the register that's storing the bottom amplitude or the register that's stored, if we're not at the bottom, then that's being stored in this, this other register that I'll talk about in a moment. But we pass in the amplitude of the center node. We pass in, if we're at the bottom, we MUX in a zero boundary condition for the down condition. Um, we read the previous amplitude of that node out of memory and pass that into the compute module. And then we read the amplitude of the node directly above us. Say we're, say we're updating this bottom node. We would read the amplitude of this node out of M10K memory and pass that into the compute module. So this gives us center, center minus one up and down. And then we still need to pass in the amplitudes of the nodes on the left and right sides, right? Which is going to come from this hardware that you've built in the next row. So when you, when the, the interconnect here will be each of these registers in a, each of the registers that you're updating will be connected also to the hardware that you're building for a specific column on either side.
So the full system that we're building looks like this, where um, we are passing, we are reading the, let me think about this. I feel like I'm talking in a confused way rather than a clear way. Suppose that we've just done an update, okay? So suppose that we've just updated a row, which means that we have just read out of memory the, um, the amplitude of the center node, the amplitude of the nodes above and below that center node, and then we've hooked up connections to the two adjacent nodes, okay? So suppose that we've just done that, and now we're moving up to the next row. The question is, what new pieces of information do we require that we haven't already gathered in the previous row update? Well, when we move up by one row, so if we were here, right, we knew about this node, this node, this node, this node, and this node at the current and previous time step. When we move up one row, we already know about this, about um, when we move up one row, right, we don't need to read this node out of memory because we had used it for the up node here. We're just moving up so it becomes the center node, but we don't need to reread that out of memory. The same is true for this node, right? This was previously our center node. When we move up by one row, that just becomes our down node. We don't need to reread that out of memory. When we go up by one row, however, we do need to access information about this node. So we will read that out of memory into our compute module in order to update our next row. The other new piece of information that we require when we move up is the state of this node at the previous time step. In order to update this node, we require the, the amplitude of this node at time step n. When we move up and we want to then update this node, we require both the amplitude of this at time step n and at n minus 1. So we need to read that n minus one amplitude out of M10K memory. These two adjacent connections come for free, right? If we're moving every row up together, then these connections come for free. And everything else gets pipelined through registers. I'm out of time. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna spend considerable time next lecture thinking about this, and I'm gonna spend a bunch of time before next lecture thinking about a way to talk about this a bit more clearly. But um, this is the sort of thing that is worthwhile to spend some time, th this particular graphic here, it is worthwhile to spend some time looking at this and thinking about it. Um, think about what you need to read out of memory as you move up the drum and think about what you can pipeline as you move up the drum. So if you, could, if you can think about that a little bit in the meantime, we'll talk more about it next time and, and hopefully things will be clearer. Are you posting these on the, in the files page on Canvas? I'll put it on the files page on Canvas. Yeah, yeah. It's probably clear at this point, but, but I'll make the, the point that the state machine for this lab is of sufficient complexity that you're not going to be able to sort of sit down in Cordis and start making it. This, this, this requires sitting down with a, with a pencil and a piece of paper and thinking about what you want to build and drawing it out and then implementing it. It really does require that step of consciously thinking about what your states are going to be and how you're going to move through them. It's not outrageously complicated. It's just, it is just beyond the limit, I would say, of what you can just sit down and implement. It does require that pencil paper step. Okay. Can you clarify one thing that you said? Um, yes. You're saying that like, in terms of like new information that we need, two nodes on the side come for free because we're sort of paralyzing across. Can you just explain that a little bit more clearly? So, um, I can try to, let me show this again. So we are, if you think about a, a specific row of the drum, right? We're gonna be storing 
the, the amplitude of the specific node that we are updating in a register. So suppose that we're updating this node in particular. Suppose that this is uij. We're going to be storing uij at time step n in a register. We can, um, in the adjacent compute module, pass this register directly as an input into that adjacent compute module so that when we increment our when we move up by a row and we pipeline what was previously unij plus one into unij because we've moved up by a row so when we pipeline in that into that register if we have the connections between our adjacent columns set up that this register is connected to Suppose we're, we're connecting it to some compute module over here. So this register is connected to the left input of this adjacent compute module. Then when we pipeline new information into this register, it just appears in the adjacent compute module. So the other way to think about it is this register u i minus one j that's being passed into the left side of this compute module. We could you know, we're making many copies of this, of this hardware here. So this lives here again for the other, um, for, the, for the column on the left. This is this register over, over here. So this would be connected directly to an adjacent compute module over here in the next column. So if you're moving up together and if you've wired it such that this is the case, then when you, when you move something into that register, if that, uh, if that other compute module is just looking at that register for information, when you put new information in there, it appears to that other module. You don't need to worry about moving things around. Other thoughts? I guess I'm um, considering like, uh, I've, been, I've, been, I've been doing like the single node that, you know, bounces back and forth and trying to simulate that and I've been through a lot of overflow issues. And so I'm wondering if, obviously when you have like, you know, the internal nodes um, and you have that, uh, you have that addition block we have to do like, you know, you have to add up all the four nearby blocks and subtract four um, times like the, the middle block. Those are going to be very close together. But when you have a boundary condition of zero, then you're going to have overflows. You can't have the node be any higher than like, I don't know what it, what is it for this, like a quarter um, when you only have one node. Uh, so do you need to do like separate, like do you need to like have some kind of like bound, like um, not boundary conditions, but like limiting conditions on either how high you start your initial pull or um, like where the starting point of any of those things can be. Because the ones that at the edge can't be very high at all. Otherwise they're gonna, you're gonna run into overflow with the, with the edge cases, right? That's true. Yes. So, so probably your initial conditions will look like a mound of some shape in the center of the drum that will fall to zero at the boundaries. So maybe you'll build a little Gaussian mound in the center of the drum, or maybe you'll build a little linear pyramid mound in the center of the drum or a little exponential mound. But you're correct that the, that initial condition should fall to zero at the boundaries for exactly the reasons that you just said. Also, if you want to be completely safe, uh, if you assume this is really a linear system, then if you make the maximum amplitude one eighth, the amplitude can never get much bigger than one eighth. So if you, uh, you might for testing, limit your amplitude to, of your initial condition to one eighth. But remember, as, as Hunter said, the UN n minus one step sets the velocity. So if you want to have a drum that starts with no motion, the initial condition for UN and UN minus one are the same, which constitutes zero velocity. Otherwise, it'll overflow on the second time step. Okay. It's more, it's more like intermediate conditions. So, I mean, obviously you shift things just like intermediate uh, calculations are overflowing rather than like the whole um, 
the whole note itself. As, as, as talked about in the last lecture, it's a really good idea to commute the adds and the subtract and the multiply yeah, by did. four. Okay. Um, but the thing is that, yeah, I said it with the boundary conditions, if you have like your middle node um, going high, like higher than like an eighth or a quarter or something like that, it, it'll overflow. So I'm just kind of thinking about when you scale that up, if that's still kind of the case. Yeah. Okay. I'll see some of you shortly then.